All right, welcome everyone. So we have a big crowd here today of five, just nice to see. <clears throat> Many more visiting online. If you're online, can you just give me a quick uh, thumbs up or thumbs down regarding the audio? Like we always do. I think it's maybe tuned a little too high. Maybe this is too quiet. Just right. Somewhere around here, I think, should work. Uh, okay, so where are we at as far as things go right now? We are starting a new unit today, which is on water. So, um, we finished the last unit. Robot has returned. Way better? Way better. Robot still here? Not here. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is like becoming the beginning two or three minutes of our class every time now. Uh, okay, I think I got this fixed and hopefully it's not uh, too overwhelming. Good. Great. Sounds like everyone's happy. So we have the previous unit which was on global warming. The questions for that have now have a deadline of this Thursday at 2.20 p.m. Deadline is set up in ACORN. Um, consider this a reminder or notice that you need to get those completed before Thursday. And I set up the next set for this current unit, the water unit, to open one minute ago. So that should be available to you as well. So you have a whole new set. I haven't set a due date for that yet because it'll depend on when we're finished this unit. Um, I've been getting emails from people about ideas for the second assignment, which I'm really happy to be getting. Um, some really interesting things coming up, it sounds like, and it sounds like people are thinking about it and have some great ideas, which I'm happy to hear about. Um, I also posted on our ACORN page at the bottom links to, I don't know, half a dozen or so previous assignments that people have made videos of. If you want to just check those out, those were, I thought, pretty good examples of uh, the range, maybe, of what would be great to be seeing. Some of them, obviously, uh, maybe require some talent that not everybody has, myself included. Not, not just don't have, like, nowhere close. But certainly, many of those other ones were quite doable by uh, anybody. And I just want to encourage people to be extremely safe when they're doing these things, not to do something risky or potentially dangerous. And uh, I just want to be very clear on that. And I know I talked about that in the assignment instructions as well, but I don't want anybody injuring themselves. And as somebody who's injured myself more than once doing chemistry demos, I, I know how quickly things can go sideways. So yeah, stick to things that you are certain are not gonna create a, a problem or an issue. Good, any questions? Everyone's happy, perfect. Um, we can start our new unit. Our new unit uh, is gonna begin with this slide. It's gonna be talking about a chemical called dihydrogen monoxide. And there's a website, dihydrogenmonoxide.org, and it has facts about this particular substance. It says it's an industrial solvent, widely used as a fire retardant, added to swimming pools to maintain chemical balance, product of combustion in automobile engines, coolant in nuclear reactors. So these are all true. These are all uses of this chemical substance. Uh, and this tells us further we should be concerned about this particular chemical because if you in, accidentally inhale it, it can be lethal. And there's around 400 deaths per year in Canada as a result of this. It contributes to soil erosion. Its vapor is a greenhouse gas. And we know what that means now from our last unit. It means it is a, has a dipole moment that changes through a vibration. Its use in, green, in, in North America has increased every year since 1970. It's a component of acid rain and is found in rare precancerous growths. So what's happened is in, in 1994, um, research was conducted by a researcher named Nathan Zoner, and his research revealed that 90% of people polled supported an outright ban of this chemical in the US. 
1998, the Australian Parliament introduced a bill to ban this substance from the country. Uh, by 2010, in fact, fast forward till today, no meaningful legislation has been passed to limit usage of this substance in any of the G8 countries. Any ideas why? Have you ever heard of this chemical before? This chemical does go by another name, which might be more familiar to you, which is water. So what's going on here? Uh, well, yeah, it's an industrial solvent, water. Um, we use it to put out fires, fire retardant. It's added to swimming pools, for sure. It's produced when you burn gas in an automobile engine, for sure, and it's used as a coolant in nuclear reactors. Um, accidental inhalation is called drowning. About 400 people a year in Canada do die from drowning. Vapor is definitely a greenhouse gas. It's a component of acid rain, right? It's the, it's the rain part of acid rain and is found in rare precancerous growths, just like it's found in every biological tissue. So these are all true facts. And this research that was done in 1994, Nathan Zoner was a high school student in California who did a, a science fair project. And what he wanted to do was see if he could make an ordinary chemical sounds scary enough that he could get people uh, to sign a ban against it. So he, they, he chose a different name for the same substance, water, and he was able to get nine out of 10 people to sign, um, to have it, have it banned. That bill in 1998, notice the date, April 1st, that was done as an April Fool's joke. Actually was done, uh, but obviously was not passed. So yeah. People can be easily led to believe that certain chemical substances can be scary when certainly, obviously, water is, is you know, it, it's dangerous, sure, like you can drown and you gotta be very careful, certain, certainly around water in certain ways, but obviously it's also a necessary chemical for us to survive, something we need to drink and, and so on. So we're gonna be looking at water, a little bit about the chemistry around water, we're gonna look at how we use water and we'll look at the water that we consume and what is done to that water to make it something that's safe for us to be drinking. So first of all, the earth has quite a lot of water. If you look at it from space, you know, it's mostly blue and that's water in the oceans. But the, I guess the, the thickness of the ocean compared to the size of the planet is actually fairly small, just like we said the same thing about our atmosphere. And if you ball up, all the water, if you took all the water on the planet and made one ball out of it, uh, compared to the size of the planet, it's like this picture on the left, that little round blue ball. It's like all the water on Earth pulled into one place. And the right side picture is the water's put back in the oceans, but all of the atmosphere, all the air, is put into one little ball. So the volume of water on Earth is less, maybe half as much as the volume of air that we have on Earth. But of course, most of that water is in the oceans, and as water that we can make use of, the ocean water has salt dissolved in it, so we can't drink it, we can't put it on our crops. Most of the uses that we might have for water, ocean water is no good. So fresh water makes up around 2.6% of the water that's present on Earth. So the fresh water doesn't contain salt, and that's what we can drink and, and use for, for farming and so on. However, almost all of that water is locked up in the ice caps, in glaciers, or is locked underground. When I say it's locked underground, I mean we can drill down and get it, but um, it's not freely available. A very, very small percentage of water on Earth is actually present in lakes, rivers, atmosphere, or in our soils, or other reservoirs that we can easily gain access to. Okay, so if you're an animal and you're out in the woods, like a deer or something, uh, the water that you experience that you can drink is a tiny, tiny fraction of the total amount of water that's present on Earth. So yeah, of the fresh water, around 70% is locked up in ice and snow, which is mostly located at the poles. Of course, there's some of this in high mountains as well. I say that's unaccessible for us to drink, and, and I guess that's mostly true, but I think in, in Newfoundland, there's icebergs obviously that come down. I think there's a, a distillery that might make vodka that's made by um, taking water from icebergs that float down. 
They take the icebergs and melt them and use that to make the vodka. Uh, I'm sure Jasmine can tell me. She's from Newfoundland. She's in the chat. I'll let you know 10 seconds later when this reaches them. About 30%, I said 70% was in, was in locked up in ice. About 30% is underground. We can get at this by drilling. So if we have wells, we can get at this water underground. Uh, but yeah, very, very small fraction is, is present on the surface. So of the water that we do use, um, most of it is used for irrigation and in industry, 92%. So sprayed, you know, growing crops and so on. Around 8% is used like piped to your home and used in your home. And of the water that's piped into homes, roughly half of that, actually roughly 70% of that is used for outdoor purposes. It could be watering your lawn. It could be filling pools, this sort of thing. Um, only 30% is used indoor. Uh, much of that is, is wasted in terms of leaks and so on. It's a tiny, 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 tiny fraction that we drink of the total fresh water that we use. So yeah, we produce a huge amount of, uh, of fresh water. Very tiny amount of it is, is used for, for safe drinking water. Question one, how much of the fresh water on earth can be found in rivers or lakes? And the answer is D around 1%. The majority is in ice caps, glaciers, uh, and groundwater. So in terms of the chemistry of water, I mean, the molecule, uh, the, the, the chemical formula of water is well known as H2O. It's one of the few chemicals many people are aware of, just in the general public. Um, this formula was discovered by Humphrey Davy way back when, when he made that big battery and stuck the electrodes in water and bubbled up, he noticed there was two parts hydrogen for one part oxygen that were produced when he did that. Therefore, he figured out there's a ratio of two to one hydrogen to oxygen. And we know now with a very good amount of detail what the actual structure of a water molecule looks like. It's three atoms, two hydrogens and an oxygen. oxygen oxygen's in the center and they form two covalent bonds two OH covalent bonds. And the shape of the water molecule is kind of bent, kind of like, uh, like a rooftop. And the angle that is made between the two OH bonds is 104.5 degrees, roughly 105. And um, we also know there's a big electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen. So both of these bonds are very polar. We talked about polar bonds in the context of CO2 back in the previous unit. And for CO2, remember the shape was linear. It was a straight line. And because it was a straight line, that meant that the two dipoles, the two polar bonds actually cancel out. So CO2 is a non-polar molecule. But water is polar because water is not a straight line. The two polar bonds do not cancel each other out. So the bond is polar and the molecule is polar. That means it'll be a very polar liquid. So that means it has a positive charge on one side, a negative charge on the other. Not a full positive or a full negative, it's a partial positive and a partial negative charge on the two sides of the molecule. Great, we now know everything there is to know about water, right? We know its shape, we know its angle, we know how many atoms, structure, etc. I wonder actually if you go back to like, I don't know, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, back when Davy determined it was H2O, you just think of how much work it was or how much advancement was required to know what the actual molecule looked like compared to just knowing what the ratio of the elements was. Actually a significant amount. I think it was probably um, the early part of the century before we really, early part of the previous century, 19, 20 or so before we really had probably a good idea. Uh, okay, so we say water is polar. We say that there's a, a partial negative charge on the oxygen because it's more electronegative. Partial positive charge on the hydrogens because compared to oxygen, they're not as electronegative. And so we have this positive end and negative end of the molecule. So what this means is that the positive end of a molecule of water will be attracted to the negative end of another molecule and the negative end of water will be attracted to the positive end of another. 
So we have these things, we call them intermolecular forces, where molecules will attract other molecules because they have this, you know, uneven balance of charge in the molecule. So another way to say this is these molecules will stick together. They're sticky. Water molecules will stick to other water molecules because they have these imbalanced charges. CO2 doesn't have that. CO2 doesn't have that imbalanced charge because it's nonpolar, so CO2 doesn't stick together very well with other CO2 molecules. And that's why CO2 is a gas. It can let go of its partners, it can fly up in the air and become a gas, where water at room temp is a liquid because the molecules really are attracted to each other. There's a name for this attraction. In water molecules, it's especially strong, and it's called hydrogen bonding. And when you have a molecule that has an OH bond or an NH bond, we say these molecules can have this unbalance of charge, imbalance of charge, and it's strong enough that it causes these molecules to be very sticky. Okay, water molecules will attract other water molecules very strongly, and so strongly enough that we give it a special name, hydrogen bonding. So in a, like a glass of water or a container of water, this hydrogen bonding extends in all directions. It extends away in three dimensions, and it forms this big network. All these molecules you can think of are all kind of stuck to each other, and they form a liquid. They can move, of course, the molecules, they can move around, they can flow, but they, uh, they can't easily separate away from the pack, okay? Almost think of it like it's like a, I don't know, this is maybe, this is just off the top of my head and maybe a really bad analogy, but it's like a, a flock of ducks that are running around in a park. They all want to stay together, but they can move relative to each other. They can move in and out, but they don't want to stray off, off on their own. And the water molecules are like this too. Um, because of this strong hydrogen bonding holding the whole group of these molecules together. That's why when water falls, when it rains, clumps together in a raindrop, doesn't come out as a gas, you know? It, they like to stick to other water molecules, for sure. If you cool water down a little bit though, um, they still like to stick together, but they will freeze, of course. When you get below zero degrees Celsius, you get ice. It still has these hydrogen bonds, but the molecules can no longer move in and out relative to each other. They become, they adopt these fixed positions. And if you look at the, down at the molecular level, uh, uh, ice will look kind of like what you see in this picture. You know, where you can look at, you know, there's gonna be here like an individual water molecule with that bent shape. The molecules retain their molecular shapes but it forms this three-dimensional structure, this three-dimensional network. So what's, what you're seeing in this picture is all of these dotted lines are hydrogen bonds, whereas the actual like lines like that are covalent. Covalent bonds, remember, those are the sharing of electron pairs between two atoms. Covalent bonds are very strong, very difficult to break, Hydrogen bonds, they're relatively strong, but they're way weaker than covalent bonds. They're a lot easier to break. You just have to warm it up above zero and you can melt it and those bonds start to break down. But to actually destroy an OH covalent bond, you'd have to really make this very hot, like well over 600, 700 degrees Celsius. So one thing maybe you might notice about this structure of, of the water molecules and ice is they kind of form like a hexagonal kind of a pattern. Almost looks like a honeycomb. Um, and this is a feature that we see if you look at ice on a much bigger scale. Like if you take ice and allow it to, I guess crystallize is the word we would use, but for a solid to start to form, and grow large enough that we can see it, we can call this a snowflake, right? Snowflakes are just individual ice crystals. And what we see is we still kind of get this hexagonal structure. You know, we see these arms that come out. 
And so we see this hexagonal shape over and over again. And this hexagonal, hexagonal shape in what we can see with our own eyes, I mean, I guess maybe in this case it's under a microscope, but if you have really good vision, sometimes you can see uh, snowflakes. It comes from the actual structure of the actual molecules at the microscopic, not even microscopic, nanoscopic level, if that's even a word. Uh, so it's the individual molecules adopt a hexagonal shape. That shape grows until we see this hexagonal pattern repeated in the snowflakes themselves. Now, this is a pet peeve of mine. And we just came off of Christmas time. Uh, and you often see snowflakes that people will put up as decorations. But look at this one. It's got one. It's got five. Snowflakes have six arms, they're hexagonal. Not pentagons. So I hope this drives you nuts too, now, from now on. Christmas decorations, if you see snowflakes and they got five, if they got, they're pentagonal, chuck them out. They should just drive you nuts because it's not a real representation of the actual molecular structure. Um, I noticed a book, it was in the bookstore, I think it was, it was Christmas time actually looking for books and it was a Frozen, Disney's Frozen book. And it had a, a five cornered snowflake on it as well. And I, 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 I got a little mad, not too bad. I didn't make too much of a scene. Um, but then I went looking for that same book cover online and everything I could find with Frozen had only six sided uh, snowflakes. So. For the most part, I'm not going to complain about Disney Frozen, except for that one book that I found. See if I can find it somewhere. So yeah, none of these five-sided ones, only six-sided ones that look like this are acceptable. Great. Um, water is not the only substance that can exhibit hydrogen bonding. Anything that has OH bonds in the molecule or NH in the structure. Um, yeah, Lisa said she would speak to the manager about that, uh, about that book, yeah. See if I can get a band, right? That's as good of a reason as any to ban a book, kid's book. Um, anything that has an OH or an NH in it can exhibit the same sort of hydrogen bonding because what we're looking at is the electronegativity difference between these two atoms, between the oxygen and the hydrogen. So this is a molecule of sucrose, better known as sugar. And what you can see in sucrose is that it's covered in these OH groups all over it. And for that reason, sugar can hydrogen bond as well. It's got these areas of positive and negative charge buildup that'll very strongly attract to other molecules that have those same types of bonds, like water, like sugar, and for this reason, um, sugar is actually extremely soluble in water. I think in one kilogram of water, you can dissolve around three kilograms of sugar. And like the resulting thing that you would make would be like syrup, I guess. Uh, but, but it's extremely soluble. Like molasses is basically a, a solution of, uh, of sugar and water for the most part. Some minor other things in there as well. Simple syrup, I think simple syrup is what you call it when it's just sugar and water, right? There was a molasses flood in 1919. Just as a, this is a total random aside. Uh, what they used to do is bring molasses in. It was, it was a primary sweetener used around that time. Um, they'd bring it in and they would, they would come in on ships to Boston and they would store it in these big tanks near the harbor and then they could take small amounts out and put it in bottles, or they could ferment it and make rum, or they could refine it and make white, what we call table sugar. And they had a giant tank of it and it exploded in 1919, it just ruptured. And then all the molasses came out and flowed down towards the harbor and most of it went into the harbor. You can see sort of the aftermath in this image, the kind of the wreckage. It uh, killed 11 people that were swept up in this like torrent of molasses. It killed a bunch of horses and so on too. It was 2.3 million gallons of molasses that had spilled out. Uh, it was a 50 feet foot high wave. You can imagine 
a 50 foot high wave of molasses coming at you. That's what people experienced then. So extremely destructive. Uh, they say it was like a few days before the harbor was not brown anymore, just from all the molasses that went in the harbor. And once it happened, what people did almost immediately is they came down to the scene with buckets and they like would scoop up a bucket of like road molasses and like bring it home. That was their molasses for a while. So there you go. Guess molasses was a bigger deal then. So not everything, of course, can have hydrogen bonding. You need these OH bonds. Lots of substances don't have OH bonds or NH bonds. And for that reason, they don't have hydrogen bonding. And usually these kinds of molecules, if they're organic molecules, are nonpolar. They are not soluble in water. An example will be fats and oils which have chemical structures that look something like this. There's oxygens, right? There's hydrogens, these little white things, but there's no hydrogens attached to oxygens, no OHs. Waxes are another kind of molecule that don't have any OHs or NHs, so waxes are very waterproof as well. Uh, okay, hydrogen bonding. So yeah, not just OH, they can also be NH. Technically also they could be FH bonds, but we don't talk about that one too much because there's only one molecule in existence that has an FH bond, and that's HF. Hydrofluoric acid it's called sometimes, or just uh, hydrogen fluoride. HF is an acid, it's uh, an extremely nasty substance. It can um, dissolve bones. So if anyone here is a watcher of Breaking Bad, that was the acid they used, I believe, in season one, episode two, to try to dissolve a dead body. Uh, it would work great on the bones, but it wouldn't work so great on other parts. I, I'm not gonna get into detail how to dissolve a dead body here, but uh, anyway. What they show on the show is only partially, if you, if you watch what happens in the show, this isn't much of a spoiler, but they fill a bathtub with HF and Bathtub is made out of ceramic, which is, I believe, a calcium-based material. Hydrogen fluoride will eat right through that. And that's, of course, what happens in the show. So it eats right through the bathtub. And uh, Walter White complains and tells them they need to use plastic. And plastic is what exactly you should use if you're storing HF. But other than HF, we don't really have to worry about molecules with HF bonds here. But it's the OH and the NH, which are extremely widespread, extremely common, and they make these molecules stick to water molecules and therefore make them dissolve well in water. Hydrogen bonding is also important in DNA. Uh, DNA is made up of a double helix. There's two strands, two individual strands, which kind of wrap up around each other. And inside, in the inner part of DNA, we have what we call DNA bases. And these B DNA bases are stuck to each other using hydrogen bonding interactions. So this would be one DNA base, which is G, guanine, cytosines on the other side, which is C, and holding a single base pair together here are these three hydrogen bonds, these pink ones. They're not covalent bonds, they're relatively weak compared to covalent bonds, uh, but they're strong enough to have some very important consequences for our, our lives. And so you can separate the two strands of DNA if you heat them up or add certain enzymes or certain things like that, you can disrupt these hydrogen bonds. But ordinarily in our body's DNA, when it's wrapped up inside of the nuclei of our cells, has all these hydrogen bonds holding the two chains together. A few more questions. What is the shape of a water molecule? So there's a movie called The Shape of Water, which sadly doesn't talk at all about the structure of an H2O molecule should just be like a hydrogen, an oxygen, and a hydrogen with an angle of 104.5 degrees. So the answer is B, bent with 105 degree angle. I guess that's um, 104.5, 105, you know, rounding. But it's not linear, that's CO2, CO2 is linear. Cyclic, no, there are such thing as cyclic molecules, but it's not that. Uh, spherical, we, we saw another molecule that was bent like this, didn't we? We saw ozone. And we said ozone had a structure that was bent as well, although I think the bond angle for ozone 
It's like a 118 or something like that. It's not 104.5. Anyway, it's amazing that we can actually measure these angles with such accuracy, and we can predict them as well. We have theoretical models that predict these. So we, I think we understand how molecules form structures quite well. Next question, what is the strong intermolecular force that causes water molecules to stick together? It is hydrogen bonding, right? Covalent bonding is not an intermolecular force. It's an intramolecular. It's a force within a molecule that holds the atoms together. We have covalent bonding. We have ionic and metallic, which are also wrong. But hydrogen bonding would be your correct answer here. Here's another question. Look at these molecules. We would look at any one of these molecules and we could predict that these would be likely to be fairly water soluble. Sugar we already talked about. Urea is a component of urine. You know, it's, it's dissolved in our urine when we pee. And you can see it's got these carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. It's got these NH2s. And so because we have NH bonds, Urea can exhibit hydrogen bonding. That means it'll stick to itself, it'll stick to water, it, and that means it'll dissolve well in water, which is great for us. Aspirin has an OH. It's got a lot of other stuff that is not OHs, so aspirin is, is sort of like partly soluble in water. So you can have molecules, the more OHs you have, the more soluble it will become. Sucrose is extremely soluble, aspirin, Partially soluble, I guess we would say. You can dissolve some in water, but not a huge amount. Ethanol has an OH. Ethanol can be mixed with water in any proportion. They'll always dissolve in each other. Vodka is like a 40% mix of ethanol and water. In fact, you can go higher than 40%. What's it called? Uh, alcool, you can get in Quebec, which is like 95% ethanol, 5% water which by the way is the absolute max alcohol content you can get if you've produced the ethanol by distillation. It's impossible to distill alcohol from water higher than 95%. You can get it if you do some tricks, like you can do distillation and add benzene and that'll get you up to I think to 98%. There's some other ways to remove that last little bit of water, but if you're doing it, um, just by basic distillation of a fermented product. 95% is the highest you can go. Acetic acid has an OH. Vinegar, this is the main flavor component, or main compound in vinegar. Vinegar is just a mixture of this and water. You have white vinegar. Um, and melamine is this last one. Melamine has NHs, NHs, NHs. It's highly water soluble as well. Uh, melamine is a compound that you may be less familiar with. And melamine actually has been the subject of a number of scandals in recent years. And if you look at this molecule, what you might notice is that there's a lot of nitrogen in this molecule. And another thing that has a lot of nitrogen in it is protein. So there are tests that can be done on foods to measure the nitrogen content of food. And a calculation is done from that number which tells you the protein content. So it's kind of an estimate, but you know, when you read the back of a box of cereal or something like that, it'll have, sometimes it'll say number of grams of protein that can be measured by measuring the amount of nitrogen. Because protein is more or less pretty much the only nitrogen containing chemical found in food to any significant extent. Um, the protein content is very important for certain foods like protein powder, if you're, you know, needing to gain muscle mass or wanting to gain muscle mass. Uh, protein content is very important in baby food. It's very important in pet food. These are all, all certain foods where the protein content is actually very critical. Um, certain food manufacturers in certain countries, not Canada, uh, were found guilty of spiking food with melamine. By adding melamine to food products like baby formula and like pet food, because it's very high in nitrogen, therefore when you do the nitrogen test, it shows an artificially high protein content. So it was a way you could kind of water down food, throw in melamine, and it looks like it has the same protein content as the, the native stuff. So it's a way to kind of, I guess, save money. Uh, it turns out melamine is moderately toxic to human beings, but it's very toxic to dogs. 
And so there was a, there, there have been cases in the news, and I'm sure you can Google this, melamine poisoning, where people were buying pet food, giving it to their dogs, and their dogs were passing away because they were easily hitting their LD50 because, of course, dogs will eat a large amount of their dog food, and if it spiked, it didn't take a lot to get to that point. That seems to me like a crazy kind of scandal to try to pull off because, like, how could you possibly not get caught? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, you're, there's like a 100% chance that someone's going to find you and catch you doing that, and you're going to, I don't know, go to jail or get sued or whatever. But yes, melamine will dissolve in water. So we looked at a couple of types of bonding so far. We looked at covalent bonding, which is sharing of electron pairs. And we said this was very common in uh, non-metals like water and CH4 and things like that, CO2. We said covalent bonds are very strong, very difficult to break. You can break them by heating it up to a very high temperature, or you can break them by shining high energy light, like ultraviolet light in some cases. Uh, Hydrogen bonds, we, we say they're strong, but they're nowhere near. They're like 10 times weaker than a covalent bond. They're intermolecular forces between different molecules, but still important. The third kind we're going to be looking at is called ionic bonding. Ionic bonding is what happens when you have a substance, a compound, that contains a metal and a nonmetal. So a perfect example is NaCl, where Cl is on the right side of the periodic table. It's a non-metal, where the sodium is on the extreme left, and it is a metal. So what happens when you put a metal and a non-metal together into a compound like NaCl is they don't share electron pairs. They don't, they're not into sharing like covalent bonds have. Uh, instead, what you have is a formation of a cation, which has a full positive charge, formation of an anion with a full negative charge. And these like to get together and just sit next to each other because a positive charge will attract to a negative charge. We call this ionic bonding. And ionic bonding is not just a single interaction like I've drawn here. That sodium is, well, let's pick this sodium here that's in the middle. It's attracted to that chlorine. It's attracted to that chlorine or chloride, I should say. It's attracted to that one. It's attracted to that one. And it's also attracted to one in front of it and behind it. So these ionic bonds are really this sort of three-dimensional attraction for oppositely charged ions. It extends off in three dimensions, and it holds all these, well, not molecules, all these ions together in what we call a crystal lattice. And so this is a very, very common type of bonding. And it's, it's not like molecules. Molecules we think of as small sort of discrete objects. Like a CO2 molecule, you can kind of think of it like, I guess I drew it like a ball, but it's kind of more like a rod, I guess. And they're all individual. You can have another CO2 up here and another CO2 over here. But for things like salt, it's not individual molecules anymore. It's one big extended network. Okay, so we call this ionic bonding, also very important. So anyway, we call this structure a cubic structure because if you were to look at, you know, the orientation of the atoms here, they form cubes. They form this cubic structure. Like these sodiums here, you can see form a square, and then if you went off in, in three directions, three dimensions, I made a nice mess of this slide. But anyway, you know what I mean. It forms these little cubes, which then grow and grow and grow. And this is a picture of sodium chloride crystals that you can see with your eyes. You can see the uh, watermark there too. But anyway, this is a picture of sodium chloride crystals, and they form little cubes as well. And if you ever have the chance, if you ever have access to a microscope, and you think of it, put a, just a, like, you know, just take table salt out of a salt shaker, put a little bit on a slide and look at them, and you'll see a whole bunch of little cubes like this, almost like perfect little cubes. And these are, again, it's just like the snowflakes. It's because at the atomic level, the structures it forms are little cubes. Those just grow bigger, 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 bigger until you have cr single crystals that we can see with our own eyes. So water can dissolve these things as well. And it does this basically where a water molecule, remember, has 
a partial negative end and a partial positive end. A positive cation like sodium that you see here on the right, the negative ends of water will kind of surround it. It'll wrap around it. It'll form what we call sometimes a solvent shell and it'll encapsulate the sodium and it'll like pull it off of the crystal. And so you'll have this sort of unit floating around in the water. It's a sodium plus in the middle surrounded by water molecules uh, which keep it stable. What you can also have is the negative ions can be surrounded as well like chloride here by the positive sides, by the hydrogen parts of the water molecule. And this causes things like NaCl actually to be very soluble in water. That these sorts of, of interactions, these interactions between water molecules and the ions, turns out to be a more stable arrangement than having all of the ions together in a crystal lattice like this. So things like NaCl, also very soluble in water. So we have what? Things that can hydrogen bond will dissolve in water and salts, many salts. Salts, by the way, is a, a general term we use in chem. I know when we say salt, we usually mean NaCl, but there's all kinds of different other ionic, like if that was NaBr or lithium chloride, we would call those salts as well. Um, so that's what dissolves in water, what does not dissolve in water. Things that do not have hydrogen bonding, things that are not polar like oil or beeswax, we think we talked about earlier, things like that will not dissolve in water. Also, ionic compounds that have charges that are bigger than plus or minus one are often not soluble in water either. So if you look at rocks, like many rocks, contain their ionic compounds. They form this three-dimensional array of obsolete charged ions. And they obviously aren't that soluble in water because if you, you know, wade through a river, the whole bottom of the river is covered in rocks. They're not dissolving away into nothing. If you have charges that are bigger than plus or minus one, like plus two, plus three, those have a much higher tendency to stick together as a solid because those forces holding that ionic crystal lattice together we see right here, are much stronger. Great. Another random story. This is the salad oil scandal. Um, this is actually a very interesting case. I tell the story every year, and every year I have to change um, who the richest person in the world is. Do you know who the richest person in the world is right now? I'll give you a hint. Last year it was Jeff Bezos. It's not Jeff Bezos anymore, I don't think. Yeah, it's Elon Musk now, I believe. Is, is, it, is it not him anymore? It switched back, Jeff Bezos. Before then, of course, for a long time, and he'd go up and down, would be Bill Gates. And uh, the other character you hear about as being in the top five all the time is Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett, um, his big thing, he's got a company called Berkshire Hathaway, which I believe is an investment company, uh, which is most of his fortune. But something, I think it's like 30% of his fortune or so is, for, um, for him was American Express. And a big reason for this is this salad oil scandal, and I forget the date of it, I think it was in the 1970s. And what happened is there was a company that would purchase and distribute salad oil. And what salad oil is, is like vegetable oil, you know, what you'd use to make salad dressing. And they would, it was kind of like the molasses story where they would have these big tanks that they would store oil in and then they would take that and they could refine it or they could turn it into, like put it in bottles and ship it and all this sort of thing. It was sort of like they, they would take huge amounts and then they would distribute it. And at some point, so they, they had a perfectly fine business accepting oil and then redistributing like that. Uh, at some point they realized that what they could do is take out loans and use as collateral for their loans, their stores of oil that they had in tanks. So if you had a giant tank full of oil, you know, and these tanks are like as high as the ceiling here. Um, for those online, that's like what, I don't know, 20, 30 feet, 25 feet. Um, these giant tanks full of oil, 
you know, the, the value of the oil in one of these tanks could be a million dollars. So they could say, go and kick out a loan for a million dollars and saying, I'm going to use my oil as collateral. If I default on my loan, uh, you can come take my oil. And so what they started doing was then borrowing money this way and speculating. And um, they realized that, you know, what people would do is the banks, when they went to get these loans, would go check to make sure if they had all this oil that they said they had. And these tanks had these openings at the top, and they would go in, they'd look down, they might put like a ladle or something down and bring up some oil. Look, it's full, yes, give them the loan. And so what they started doing was building a bunch of these additional storage tanks and pumping them like 85% full of water. And then they would put like 10%, 15% of oil, which would make like a foot or two at the top. And the rest was water underneath it. And so of course the bank would come along, they'd dip in from the top, yep, it's full of oil, approve all these loans, but they didn't have anywhere near the amount of oil that they were claiming to have had. They only had whatever the layer at the top was. And I don't know the exact, there's, there's a book here, which I think probably obviously will go into much more detail than my short story here. But what ended up happening is they had these huge amounts of loans based on collateral that they never had. And they used those loans to make very speculative investments. And it led to several other companies investing in them. And I don't know the exact network of exactly how this worked, but I, I do know that American Express, and this was in the 1970s when credit cards were kind of a new thing, they were heavily somehow embroiled in this, whether they were, I don't know, if they were providing the loans to begin with or, or how it worked. But what ended up happening is this, this scandal eventually blew up. Um, the company went down. It took down a whole bunch of other companies as well. It was a huge amount of bad debt. And uh, it ended up causing the, the, the very fledgling company here, American Express, to have their stock value by, go down by more than half. And uh, at the time, um, that he, he saw the opportunity um, to invest, he bought up a huge amount of shares and then it, it grew explosively since that point in time. So I forget what it is, something, a few billion of his fortunes are believed to be a consequence of this particular salad oil scandal. So all because water and oil don't mix. All because oil doesn't have hydrogen bonding and water does. So there you go. Real world consequences, even if you're more interested in financial stuff than in chemistry stuff. Question 8.4, which of the following compounds do you expect to be most soluble in water? If you get this sort of question, what you should look for is a molecule with an OH or an NH. The only one that fits the bill is C, because it has an NH2 there, it has two NH bonds. So of course that goes to this one here. None of the other ones have it. Now water that comes into our house is mostly fresh water, but it's not just pure water most of the time. Often there's other things that are dissolved in the water, which can be good or bad depending on the situation. Uh, but one issue that we have in, in a lot of places is what we call water hardness. And we say water is either hard water or soft water. Hard water is water that contains relatively high concentrations of two types of ions, calcium two plus, and magnesium two plus ions. These are not a concern at all for our health because we need calcium and magnesium in our diets. In fact, I think you'd have to drink a, a huge amount of hard water to come close to meeting your dietary needs for calcium and magnesium. So from a health perspective, it's great if your water's hard, drink it away. It can affect the taste. So some people don't like that taste, but, but yeah, don't let that slow you down. The main problem with calcium and magnesium though, is that it can combine with carbonate ions um, to make an insoluble solid called calcium carbonate. Often we call this a hard water deposit. Calcium carbonate is a solid. You can see that little S after the chemical formula means it's a solid. Uh, this is very insoluble in water. And um, you can make carbonate anytime you have carbon dioxide exposed to the water. It's 
especially if you heat the water, you can uh, easily force out calcium carbonate out of solution. So where we have water that comes in that contains calcium and magnesium, and when we heat it, often it'll send, it'll drop down the, these hard water deposits. So in a kettle, if you take an old kettle and you open it up, cut it in half like this person did, you can see all of this white flaky material inside. I notice this in my kettle at home, it's an electric kettle, but uh, you can see that flaky stuff that's present inside. A bigger issue would be for pipes. You can see this is a copper pipe that's used to transport hot water within a, a home. And what can happen over time, if you're heating water and running hot water through these pipes, is the calcium carbonate, this hard water deposit, can build up on the inside of the pipe and it'll kind of choke it off. It's almost like, looks like a, you know, like a, an artery that if you've got, got atherosclerosis or other issues like that. Uh, but of course that means you're gonna have a lot less water move through your pipes, you're gonna have plumbing problems on your hands. I had a problem in my own home actually. I have a, a furnace that has a coil in it and the coil heats water when it passes through. So it doesn't have a hot water heater like many homes have. Um, and there's something in there called an expansion tank. And the expansion tank is an area where if there's like pressure buildup inside the furnace, it can it can, it can handle that pressure by expanding into this tank. But the tank opening uh, completely sealed up because of hard water deposits. And instead of the pressure building up and expanding into the tank, it, uh, it decided to instead to um, expand into my basement, which qu created quite a mess. Fixed it though, all solved. So yeah, this can be a real issue if you have a home that contains hard water, something that you, you always have to worry about. And, and not just these things, any kind of appliance that uses hot water, like a, a coffee maker, an espresso machine, particularly espresso machines, because they have like little small holes that they inject steam and all this kind of stuff through. Uh, those can easily get clogged up with hard water deposits. Uh, the other one that, that, that strikes me is an iron. You know, you used to iron clothes and you pour water in it and it creates steam inside and the steam comes through these little tiny holes and you can like steam your clothes to help get the wrinkles out. Uh, life advice, I'm gonna give you some, some very strong life advice here. One of the best investments you can make when you're young is a high quality iron. And not a cheap like $20 iron, like spend a hundred bucks and get yourself a nice good heavy iron. It'll last you your whole life if you treat it well and Ironing clothes with a good iron is like night and day compared to ironing clothes with a really crappy one. But, 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 when you use your iron and you fill it up with water, do not use tap water. Because tap water can contain calcium and magnesium ions. They will form hard water deposits inside your iron. It'll clog up those little holes. It'll make, in the long term, it'll make your iron unusable. But in the short term, what it can do is clog the holes up a little bit, then sometimes they give away. Then you get this like brownish water come out because there's water trapped behind there for a long period of time. And it, it just makes a really gross mess. Use distilled water. And you can buy distilled water for very cheap at the grocery store. Like four liter gal, like a four liter thing of it would be like a couple dollars, two or three. And that'll easily last you a year of happy ironing. There you go. You learn a lot more than chemistry here. You'll, you're, you'll probably learn some of my idiosyncrasies as well. Like one of them is, is my uh, um, intolerance, absolute intolerance of five pointed um, snowflakes. The other one that would drive me really up the wall is if I watched somebody put tap water into an iron. Don't do it. You learned it here first. Uh, the other thing that calcium and magnesium can cause, this is another practical problem, is it reacts with soap. And it makes a, another solid that we call soap scum. And this is a very common thing to build up in showers and in tubs. And it's, it's mostly a problem when you use bar soap. Bar soap has these molecules that look like this, which can react with calcium and magnesium to make a white, insoluble solid. I say it's white, but if there's other like 
colorants in your soap or oils or other like gross stuff. Like if you're, if you're soaking in the tub in the presence of soap, uh, often it can get kind of like yellowish, can absorb things. And it, it forms a sort of hard crusty deposit inside your tub or shower. And you can kind of like scrape it with your fingernail and it'll like, it'll like scrape off. It's kind of like white and flaky. Um, it's very, very hard to scrub off if you're washing. Like if you just take a cloth and like soap, it's not gonna, not gonna wash off easy at all. So to get rid of that, the actual way to do it is to wash it with um, vinegar or even better than vinegar, there's a secret not many people know about. Buy citric acid, you can buy it in bulk, food grade citric acid, you can get it in bulk on eBay. Like, and nothing is better for washing your dishwasher or your coffee maker or anything like that. It'll go through and it'll dissolve all the hard water deposits and make it like brand new again. If the inside of your dishwasher looks disgusting after you've run a load of dishes, like white powdery substance all in the inside, you've, you've got hard water, put a little, like a third of a cup of citric acid in next time, it'll look brand new. Um, another thing about soap, and I used to wonder this as a kid, when I grew up, we had bar soap and you use that to clean your body and we had shampoo that you'd use to clean your hair. Why do we have two? Why do we use a different soap for our body? And I know most people are like, now like, oh, I just use body wash. Or, this is a great thing for me, they have two-in-ones or three-in-ones. Soap, shampoo, and conditioner. In fact, I've seen a four-in-one, which was a soap, conditioner, shampoo, and body conditioner. And I have no idea what a body conditioner is supposed to do. But that was the fourth claimed uh, in one thing. But the reason we use shampoo for our hair and bar soap, or you know, why we don't use bar soap in our hair, is because bar soap will very easily make soap scum, and soap scum loves to stick to hair. So if you wash your hair with bar soap, lather it all up in there. Of course, there's water in there too. If there's any hardness at all to your water, it'll form that deposit and that deposit will come out inside your hair. And your hair will get like heavy and like uh, not soft, it'll be coarse and it'll like lie flat. And people realized that that kind of sucks and they developed a different product. There's different types of detergents that are used in shampoos, they're called sulfates. If you look at the background, um, it'll be like SDS or SLS is often the ingredient, sodium lauryl sulfate or sodium dodecyl sulfate. Um, but yeah, the shampoo will get away from that problem. If you use uh, body wash, body wash is essentially just shampoo. It's the same thing. Uh, they might use different scents or different concentrations or whatever, but it's just, chemically it's the same. Those will not create hard water deposits. If you get hard water, if you got soap scum building up in your shower all the time, switch from bar soap to body wash and your problems will go away. Clean it first with vinegar or citric acid, get rid of it, and then switch away from bar soap and you won't have that problem anymore. Also, if you're extremely hairy, not just your hair, but the rest of your body, you may wanna switch away from uh, bar soap as well because you're not gonna be as soft as you could be. Right? You wanna switch to, to shampoo. I guess if you, if you do use bar soap for your hair, you could probably fix it by washing your hair with vinegar. I never thought of that before, but I guess it's an option. Jasmine does not trust two-in-ones or any others like that. I trust two-in-ones because I think there's zero difference between shampoo and body wash. So I think it's, it's, I don't think they do use different chemicals. Maybe like, I'm sure there's all kinds of things in there besides just the detergent and there's different smells and odors and whatever else. I notice like if you buy expensive shampoo and cheap shampoo, to me the difference is expensive shampoo, you just need like a little bit. And, and like, I think they, to make cheap shampoo, they just take expensive shampoo and add water. Like that's what it seems like to me, but I don't know anything about that side of things. Yeah, so that's what your soap will, your tub will look like if you like to have baths and like to use bar soap, it'll get this. You can't wash it off with normal detergents and things. You need vinegar or something you could scrape. 
Is it the same thing for bar shampoo? I think bar shampoo is not like that. I think bar shampoo is just regular shampoo with the water dried out of it. So yeah, I don't think there's any issue with those. Although there's something else called dry shampoo, which I, I've never used. I know because I have daughters and, um, but it's just like a powder you put in your hair. It, it doesn't, and you don't wash it or rinse it or anything. I think that's just like a, a, te a temporary fix. I don't think that's a, a substitute for washing your hair. Yeah, it's the cat in the hat. Um, this is not banned yet though, right? There's other books that got banned. Dr. Seuss. But anyway, I think the whole purpose of other Cat in the Hat or the other second one, the, there's a sequel to it, is there's like a ring around the bathtub after he has a bath and it's pink, but that, that's soap scum is really what he's looking at there. Also, there's a fantastic video song about soap scum that was made by a previous student in this course that is linked on our page at the bottom. Go to that link and, and, and watch it if you haven't yet. It's great. All right, so this soap scum is a problem uh, primarily actually for laundry soap because people were using laundry soap and what happens is two problems. If you have hard enough water, it'll react with your soap when you go to wash your clothes and you'll get this like white powdery deposit on your clothing, it's one issue. The other problem is um, it basically just kind of destroys your soap. It, it takes your soap and turns it into a solid. It's not in the water anymore it decreases the effectiveness of your laundry detergent. And so laundry manufacturers recognized this and they were trying to figure out a way to combat the calcium and magnesium that was present in hard water. And they came up with this, they came up with a molecule called sodium tripolyphosphate, which is called STP or STPP, one or the other. It has this structure, it's got three phosphoruses, 10 oxygens and a negative five charge and what this does is if you have a metal cation, like calcium or magnesium, it'll kind of come around with his arms and grab it. It'll surround it and turns it into this, what we call a complex. That complex still has a negative three charge and it's extremely water soluble. So they could dump this in, this, in, this, in the detergent or in the soap. It'll go around and it'll scavenge for all of the calcium and all of the magnesium. And so the calcium and magnesium then can no longer react with the soap and then the soap can do its job and clean your clothing with its full force, right? Problem with this stuff though is uh, it's an extremely good fertilizer. So if this would get into wastewater and that wastewater would get into either the ocean or rivers or lakes or things like that, ultimately it would cause a feeding frenzy for things like algae. It would cause what we call algae blooms. And the algae, you'd see like rivers that look like this. You know, they look like green from all the algae that's growing in there because it's all of a sudden super nutrient rich because of all this phosphate coming in from soap. Uh, you might think, well, isn't that great? Party for the, for the uh, algae. What happens then though is the algae has this sudden boom and then this crash in population and when it crashes, you have a whole bunch of dead algae in the water. It can decompose, it can sink to the bottom and the decomposition process consumes oxygen. And what happens is the, the body of water therefore is very low oxygen content and animals in the water like fish die. They float up to the bottom and they're done because there's not enough in oxygen in the water anymore to support them. So this was considered a big environmental issue and what ended up happening was after a while, this happened I think in the 90s, is people realized you should stop putting phosphates, this STPP or STP, these phosphate based substances shouldn't be in soaps anymore. And you would often see ads saying things like phosphate free, eco-friendly soaps. And I'm not sure if they were outright banned, but I think most detergents today have come up with other solutions that don't involve phosphates. Interesting thing, like you see this again and again, over and over again, we figure out some chemical solution to some problem that we're having. And everyone just like eagerly deploys the solution and only realizes a little bit later that there's a problem with that so-called solution. 
We saw it with CFCs that were fantastic for use in refrigeration and all those other things we said, until it was later people realized it was damaging the uh, ozone layer. The same thing. Uh, other ways to handle water hardness is purchase a water softener. And I don't know who here might have a water softener in their home or in their cottage or something like that. Um, water softeners are systems that basically remove calcium and magnesium from your water. And they have these two tanks. One's called a brine tank. The brine tank is full of concentrated salt water. And you can buy these big bags of salt designed for water softeners. You got to keep the tank topped up. Then it has another tank and water is pumped through the tank. So if you have a well, the well water might get pumped through this tank before it then goes into your drinking water supply in the house. And what it has in this tank are what we call a resin. They're little beads, little small beads that are coated on the surface with sodium ions. These little kind of greenish yellow things are sodium ions. And when you get a brand new tank, all these little beads are coated in sodium ions in there. What happens then if you take your hard water and pump it through and it contains the little triangles, which are calciums, the blue squares, which are magnesiums. What happens is these stick to these little beads and displace the sodiums. So by the time you get to the other end of that, that tank, you've captured the calcium and magnesium and replaced them with sodiums. And the reason, reason calcium and magnesium stick better is because they have a charge of two plus. Mg2 plus, where sodium is just one plus. So they don't stick as well. So the sodiums are easily knocked off by the calcium and magnesium and you get slightly salty water on the other side, but no hard water anymore. You've solved your hard water problem. Now you can imagine what's gonna happen over time though is eventually you're gonna saturate all of your beads and it's not gonna be able to capture any more calcium or magnesium so when this happens, you have to replenish the resin. And the way you replenish the resin is to run through the, this brine, this concentrated salt water. It, has, it basically pushes this same thing in reverse and floods that system with huge concentrations of sodium ions. So much so that it pushes away all the calcium and all the magnesium, that gets flushed down the drain and has recharged the column so it's ready to then act again. So often these things work in cycles. At night, maybe when everyone's asleep, it'll recycle through and, and push off. It'll clean the column off and have it ready for the next morning. So that's how water softeners function. It has the part with the resin here and it has the brine tank here. And you can buy these bags of salt little brick, bricks. And the tablets that, that go in there, they're designed to be porous and dissolve very rapidly. So next question, hard water comes from the reaction of carbonate ions with what metal ions? There's a sign you have hard water if your taps look like that. Very common to see that or shower heads. You see that as well, this sort of crusty stuff build up on your shower head. Is it magnesium two plus and, and potassium plus or K plus? Sodium plus and potassium plus, magnesium plus and calcium plus or magnesium two plus and calcium two plus? D is our answer. It's magnesium and calcium, and both of those take charges of plus two. So this one, I guess, is the trickiest one here. Okay, it's 3.39. We've been at this for about an hour and a half. I think that's it for today. We did get a good chunk of the way through. We got, I guess, slide 42. We're about, I'd say, a third of the way through this unit. So I'd expect we'll finish it next Monday. Um, we haven't really gotten yet to drinking water, what's done to drinking water to make it safe, but we did talk about the chemistry behind the water molecule, about its shape, about its structure. We talked about um, hydrogen bonding in detail, what dissolves in water and what won't, and uh, hard water. Spent some time talking about that as well. And hopefully learned a couple of things about 
shampoo and what we should wash ourselves and not wash ourselves with. All right, so thank you everyone for coming and we'll see people on Thursday. Don't forget, the questions are due for the previous unit before class on Thursday. Wonderful.